We're going to take a break from coding and start to talk about grant writing, okay? So Joanna has, Joanna Mills Fleming is here today. She's actually my PhD supervisor, so she and I have been working together for a fairly long time now. Um, and she's also been a part of OTN since its conception. So she's been a really big part of the data committee, it, coming up with new statistical methods for animal tracking data and new visualization methods as well. She's also a member of the scientific advisory committee of OTN. Um, her personal research interests include developing statistical methodologies for spatial, spatial and temporally correlated data. And so she doesn't just do, uh, do, doesn't just do animal movement modeling, but she's also really big and had a lot of success in the fisheries industry as well. And so she's, luckily for me, uh, said that she would help us out and give us a little talk on the success of her, her grant writing and how her tips for actually conducting grants. And we're lucky too because she's also been a part of the NSERC Discovery Grant Review Council for three years. And so thank you so much, Joanna. My pleasure. Um, thank you, Kim. I hear you guys are doing an awesome job. Uh, so uh, I'm disappointed I can't actually participate more. Uh, so as Kim said, is that too close or are we okay? Okay. As Kim said, I'm a statistician and a full professor in the math and stats department here at Dell. Um, I've been here sort of since the get-go. So I started off as an assistant professor and moved through the ranks. Um, and I've been asked to talk to you about grant writing. So I thought in order to... Uh, um, keep your attention or convince you to listen to me, I tell you a bit about um, sort of how I gained this experience, if you will. So I'm currently incoming chair of the Math and Stats Liaison Committee for NSERC. So the job um, of that committee is really to help NSERC guide their awards program, so the Discovery Grant program, all the way up to how they allocate funding to the institute. So I realize you're not all mathematicians and statisticians, and uh, um, so may not be familiar with some of these, but BRRRS, PIMS are big sort of institutes here in Canada that fund uh, research in mathematics, statistics, more recently data science. Um, and this committee sort of guides how NSERC should spend their money to run those institutes. I'm also chair of the Statistical Society of Canada Research Committee, which does more or less the same thing, but is the voice for basically uh, statisticians in Canada. Um, this may be useful, especially to those of you who are sort of early career researchers, so students, postdocs. Um, I am a, a member of the scientific review panel for the postdoctoral program for ERMS which is, again, sort of mathematics geared, but a lot of applications for postdocs in some sense, as hopefully you'll, I'll convince you of here in a few minutes, are, are somewhat generic. Um, perhaps my biggest uh, um, or greatest experience I've had in terms of both grant writing and reviewing comes from chairing the NSERC 1508 um, Discovery Grant Evaluation Group. Uh, and so essentially what that afforded me the opportunity to do was to read over 300 discovery grants. Um, and the last year I served on that committee, I was the chair, so I was really responsible for ensuring that those grants were given out fairly across this country. Um, in addition to sort of the 300 or so statistics applications, I also have rev reviewed nearly 100 applications that went to 1503, which is ecology and evolution. So if you're in Canada and you're doing quantitative work, which obviously some of you are, then it could be 1503 that you apply for, for a discovery grant. Um, and so that was really a tremendous uh, amount of work. Uh, reading, as many of you have, know who've applied or prepared even, say, just one grant, it's a huge amount of uh, time to prepare these, and it's also uh, a huge amount of time to review them and make sure that they're reviewed fairly. Um, and I think if, I, I wish actually now, I was thinking about this this morning, that I'd actually had somebody talk to me early on in my career about how to prepare a grant. Um, and I'm not saying that to sort of slam Dalhousie. 
I think uh, perhaps this sort of uh, um, opportunity is far too often, and maybe it's something you sort of put on the back burner and you think is sort of too generic um, in terms of how it's presented by the Faculty of Grad Studies, who knows? But there's a few sort of hints and tips that I have for you that I, I do truly believe would have helped me to secure more funding and earlier on in my career. Um, and so hopefully what I've told you in the last uh, few minutes gives me some credibility to do just that. Um, I should also tell you that I've been successful in obtaining discovery grants and in the last competition I got a, an accelerator which is essentially sort of a big pot of money on top of the, the usual amount which allows you to go on and do um, more exciting things a lot faster. Um, and so that's sort of been a notable um, thing in my career, I would say. Um, I think I should also add that after coming back from NSERC, so essentially when you're, you serve on this committee, you go up and you spend a week in Ottawa and about four months prior to that on the phone every week discussing grants um, or applications for grants, I should say. So I came back and I was pretty enthusiastic about how much I'd actually learned. Um, at the time, my PhD student, Ethan Lawler, was, um, had decided to apply for a Vanier. Um, and so, I, I mean, Ethan has a Vanier because Ethan is a fabulous student. But I felt like for the first time in my career, I could guide him through that application process with much more sort of certainty and um, perhaps confidence than I had before. And he actually won a Vanier. He was the first statistician. Um, to be awarded a Vanier in this country. So I attribute a little bit of the service I did to NSERC um, to that success. So all that said, um, here are some of my tips. Um, and I know there's some people from the US in the audience who will have to apply to NSF instead of NSERC. Um, NSERC is moving. It's not moving quickly, but in terms of uh, the number of successful applications that are funded every year, it's going lower. So it's getting more competitive and it's harder to get an NSERC discovery grant than it ever has been before. So in the US, the number is around 20%. In Canada, it's been upwards of 80% and it is going down fast. Um, so there is no room in the system and there is no point in putting in a rushed application. I have done it. I was on maternity leave. I had like a three month old baby. I wasn't getting enough sleep. I said, oh, I should just do it because then it's done. There is no room for that sort of application in this system anymore. So if you don't think you can prepare the grant properly within the time frame that you have, try and defer it to the year following because it's in some sense a wasted effort if you don't. Um, and I don't think you can apply every year. So having um, now being in the situation where I can look back and say, why did I rush that? Really, for the sake of the year and doing something properly, it's worth it. Because even if you're not successful, you'll get much more useful feedback. Um, so I guess part and parcel to that is to start early with these applications. Keep your CCV up to date, because that's just a pain. The CCV system is actually changing once again, but if you keep all of your important information, so your papers, what's in progress, what's in, in um, submission, what's in review, then that saves a lot of time at the last minute pulling things together. So I tend to, I actually sometimes follow my own advice, I tend to keep my CCV up to date for that very reason. The unfortunate but fortunate thing is also, especially for the discovery grant competition, the rules are changing all the time. So how you would prepare a grant last year is going to be slightly different than how you'll prepare it this year. Case in point, the last year I was serving on the committee as chair, we were told by NSERC that there was going to be a small but significant component devoted to EDI. Okay, so if in the year that rolled out after, you had a comment saying that you thought seriously about EDI, it was noted. The year after that, it was necessary. So if you can pay attention to those rules, you can even get sort of the language in early. You need to think deeply about things like equity, 
diversity, inclusion, and how you're going to handle those in your labs and in your workplaces. Um, and it was very interesting to me how diverse, in fact, uh, the approaches were, but how tremendously valued they were by the evaluation group. So when new things come in like that, they're totally, in some sense, unrelated to your actual raw research, but they're essential to your application. So if they're looking for a statement on EDI, make sure it's in there. And make sure that it somehow links into your program. This one sounds like the sort of thing I say to my two teenagers, follow the directions. Um, and I'm not sure, I, uh, perhaps it's just how I went through school and in university I was very science-based. Um, but when you read a description of what's supposed to be contained in your application, it needs to be there. So things like short-term objectives, long-term objectives, nobody can go, nobody has the time. Each application is reviewed for 15 minutes. It's discussed for 15 minutes. No one has the time to go through and sort out what's a long-term objective and what's a short-term objective. They have to be staring people in the face. So if you're asked for something like that, make it obvious. That sounds trivial, it sounds like it shouldn't really be a value, but it's essential because of how the reviewing process works. So be meticulous, and I feel like I would have had a great deal more success early on. I think my research program has been generally well thought out, but I don't think it was as dis well described as it could have been had I paid attention to those bullets. So do what you're asked. Um, download the grid. So I actually brought the grid. Uh, it's tricky to find, um, and it will obviously be different if you're uh, getting funding through NSF or something, but there is a grid that has to be made public by NSERC that changes every year that tells the evaluation group how to rank or how to assess the applications. It talks about the criteria for the merit of the proposal, the excellence of the researcher, and the training of HQP, which is highly qualified personnel. You can go on and you can see exactly what people are looking for. And so having a look at the grid, the last time I applied to NSERC, I looked at that grid and I could guess what my score was going to be. Not because they were all one side of the grid or the other, but because I knew what was in my application. And so if you've written a good application, you should be able to look at that grid and have a sense of where you're going to fall on it. Um, when your application is reviewed. Another, and this again pertains specifically to the Canadian system, write a good notification of intent. That is critical. Far too often I hear people say, okay, I just got to do that over the weekend. The notification of intent actually is what is used by the committee to determine who will review your application. Okay, it's not the whole proposal. By the time we get the proposals in January, the committee has already been assigned. So if you think that your application, for example, justifies joint review, so you want an uh, ecologist and you want a statistician or a data scientist, that needs to be conveyed in the NOI because it will not be changed after, or very rarely is it changed. So the NOI and doing a good job of that is almost as essential as writing the research proposal. And that's a thing I think that goes m missed um, uh, more often than not. You will have every right to look at the membership. So you can, I actually went on to this morning just to make sure I had this right. The Discovery Grant competition was last week. You can go on and look at who's on the Discovery Grant committee for your particular um, group, and you can tailor your NOI. If you know a person or you look at their research and you decide, well, well, that aligns well with what I do, they're going to appreciate this, then think about the language that you use in the NOI and how you can attract them to reading it. Okay, you have, that is your right and privilege. Um, don't worry too much about the external reviewers. So you are at liberty to propose reviewers. I was shocked at how little impact they have on the application assessment. 
And there's a few reasons for that. For that. It's not that NSERC is looking to waste people's time. Uh, the main reason is that often those reviews are not done or the instructions aren't followed. So when I ask someone to review a grant application for me, I send them the instructions. I highlight the parts that I think are most critical. Because what a, a reviewer can't use the grid. A reviewer can say, well, this is a great proposal. But unless they give reasons, unless they follow the or answer the questions asked of the reviewer, then it doesn't get much weight at all. So I guess the, the, the main point here is if you're going to list reviewers, select people you know are going to take the job seriously, do it on time, and highlight the parts that you see as most critical to the success of your application and make them aware of that. Um, I've told you it's 15 minutes per application. That number shocked me to start with. You spend months preparing something like that, and in often less than 15 minutes it's done. Make things easy to find. Make all the things that are asked of you available and clear in the proposal. Um, the other thing, and nobody told me this, I will tell you, the first time I applied to NSERC, I didn't actually mention that I'd been on maternity leave for a year. Because I thought back in 2005 that that would be seen as uh, lacking energy and enthusiasm or something. That is a mistake. So the way NSERC works, if you, so we are tasked with evalu evaluating you within a five-year window or six-year window. I think it's six now. If you were on, say, paternity leave for six months of that window, the committee is required to evaluate you in a 5.5-year window. Okay, so the window adjusts. You are not doing yourself a disservice if you are on leave or if you are ill, that should be made clear in the application. Obviously not the details, but your interpretation of how it affected your window. So if you were off sick for three months, say you were off sick three months and it took you another month maybe to ramp back up. It has to be in there. You can't leave the committee. So you can't say, hey, I was ill during the window. You have to make your case. I was ill for X months, and this is how many months in the window it affected. The committee then has all the information that they need, and the onus is on you to report that accurately, but report it. It's really essential. I've seen great applications where it's obvious that there's been something happen, and if it's not stated, we can't infer. So make that information crystal clear. So I said that a different way here on my notes. Tell your story if you're on sick leave or any sort of leave. Make it clear. State how it, infected, it impacted your window. Okay, and look at the rules. There's all sorts of rules outlined by NSERC which tell you what is appropriate and what is not. It's all there. Um, and this is not meant to scare you. It is getting more and more competitive, and it's getting more and more competitive very, very quickly. Stats, for example, in the competition that ended last week had a record number of applications, which is good and bad. Um, if you get rejected, it is not the end of the world. You can walk around with your head down, hating NSERC, saying that it wasn't done fairly, and it gets you nowhere quickly. It is both prestigious and, I actually believe, essential in this country to hold an NSERC grant. And so you have to figure it out. The best way is to look at the information. So if an application is rejected, the onus is on the evaluation group to communicate clearly why it was rejected. And in my experience, that's done well. So you will get a collection of uh, information back, which indicates what was, with, what was missing and why. And you include that in the next go-round. 
You can also reach out to NSERC. There are program officers that will then dig out the application and go th right through it with you from start to finish. You lift your head up and on you go. And you'll get one next year. So there are going to be more and more people that are rejected. And it's just that there's not enough money to go around. And remember that the, 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 the committee itself is not trying to determine if an application is funded or not funded. The committee scores the application. Then completely independent of that, the program and group leaders decide of the money allocated to this particular group, how many bins are we going to fund? So you get put in a bin depending on how many, depending on your score. And it may be that one year bin J, which is the bin you're in, gets funded, and one year it doesn't because there just wasn't enough money left. And that is basically life. So it sucks, uh, but it is the way it works. And I have no, I, I truly believe having seen all of these different, I've seen applications right from ECR, so first time out, early career researchers, no training of HQP, all the way up to, you know, what they call outstanding, outstanding, outstanding on all three criteria. These would be leaders, people who are doing groundbreaking work that's impacting a very broad community, and I really believe there's a place for everyone. So you have to work hard, but making sure that you tell your story is essential. So there's a whole bunch. When I first started writing Discovery Grants, I was really focused on the research proposal, making sure it was innovative and original. And that is a huge part of it, but there's other parts that if you don't have in will just completely um, mean that you miss uh, the mark because it's so competitive. Um, a few more specifics, and this is really for the Canadian system. Get involved in the training of HQP, so and your insert call students. They, need, they could be undergrads, masters, PhD, postdocs. Postdocs maybe is a bit of a stretch if you're still a student yourself, but get involved. There, it is no, from NSERC's perspective, it is no more valuable to be training a PhD student than it is to be training, doing a, an undergraduate honor student. They are valuable contributions to the training of HQP. So get involved. Nobody counts up, oh, this person had three PhD students and this person had two. It doesn't work that way. You have to show that you've done quality training. Question. So you evidence that by telling your story. So if you were, say you were on, uh, uh, you were a supervisory committee for an honors project, write it in your application. There's a, a section devoted to the training of HQP. And I think people get caught up in thinking, oh my gosh, I've only been involved with one undergraduate student and no master students. You have to give evidence that you've done something. So get involved now. And I truly believe it doesn't necessarily, it's not a numbers game. Just like papers. It's not all about how many sole author papers. It doesn't matter as long as you make sure that your evaluation, your contribution is original and innovative. It doesn't matter if you're a co-supervisor of a PhD student or a, a sole supervisor, as long as your role is clear. So some of the metrics that I think, especially for somebody my age, were sort of brought up to think are essential are not essential. What's essential is making sure that the work you're doing is quality, it's innovative, it impacts the community. The broader the community it impacts, the better off you are. A lot of it's to do with impact. And you also have to make the case for what impact means for the research you do. Is it industry impact, government impact, academic impact? Who knows? Um, explain your contributions. You don't need 17 single author papers to get an answer grant. OK? Um, Demonstrate that the research is quality, impactful, important to a broad community. Sorry, Kim, I've got two more things. Uh, and I guess finally, and this is important, especially on the dark days of writing grants, NSERC does not fund projects. NSERC funds programs. So all the parts, the training of the students, your EDI plan, 
all of them need to link. And that's what makes these time consuming to write. So you want to have a program. You want to have short term objectives, long term objectives. Even with so far as impact, you want to explain what your career aspirations are. So I'll stop there. But hopefully that gives you a sense of what um, NSERC is looking for and as a result, the academic community here in Canada. So they're equal weight. So you have, there's three criteria, not two. So there's excellence of researcher. So that's going to really come into your publications, your output. The next is the merit of the proposal. So you can have, you could score, you could be off the charts or off the grid with the merit of the proposal and perhaps mediocre on excellence of research or maybe other, th maybe you've been out in industry, you haven't been doing research. But you can really kill it with the merit of the proposal if you write a good proposal. And then the third part is the training of HQP. And that's where it gets very tricky for young people, which is why I'm saying get involved, informally or formally. Because there is, NSERC does have allow for early career researchers to get a moderate on HQP, which is generally not fundable, but is for ECR. So there's a bit of a a catch-all for that, um, but notwithstanding that, if you've done a little, then it it's, takes you sort of out of the moderate and into the, the truly fundable, which just means a higher bin and more money. Just a follow-up question on the, on the training. How do like workshops like this look compared to supervision? I mean, they're both important, or...? They're both important and really, and again, it's up to you, make the case. Yeah. Say how many people, so say this is your discovery grant application. Yeah. Tell them how many people were here. Yeah. All of that sort of thing. The other thing that is useful or essential if you have had trained students is where do they go? Right. So they don't actually have to go you know, to Stanford and, and get an assistant professorship to have impact. It could be that they go work for, in the, the, the line of uh, research I do, they go work for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Who knows? But make it clear that it's an impactful position if it is. Yes, yeah, sorry. So the question was, I do a lot of sort of, it, I would call it informal supervision of students. And the comment was, it sounds like you're telling me to sort of formalize some of that. I would formalize it. And it just means that you devote less of your space to trying to make a case. If you can say, I'm on these four committees, ask to be on the committees. I've never turned anyone down <laughs> who wanted to be on a student's committee because it's added value. So ask to be on those committees and uh, formalize it wherever you can because it just makes it easier. And you're not, you know, it's the same amount of work. So I think I could speak to those, so in, yeah, so the question is, if you do get d rejected from uh, the discovery grant system, what else can you do? So my hope is that most people going off into academia, in this country at least, are given a startup grant. And part of the, re the reason, so I still have some of my startup grant, it was some tiny little amount in 2005, but I still have it. Um, and it's kind of emergency money. So you can pretty much 
survive for a bit on a startup grant, and I would negotiate that when I take a job uh, and get it to be as big as you can for exactly this reason. Um, I think I can only really speak to what other outlets are there in the maths, math and stats world. So CANSI, which is the Canadian Statistical Sciences Institute, has a variety of programs. I would search out people on campus that do work like you do and look to big granting opportunities. So Sarah Iverson here was one of the people who got me involved in the OTN. And that has been tremendously impactful to my career and a lot of fun. I being, being part of these bigger grants is energizing and fun. And you shouldn't do one and not the other, but often those are helpful if you do have a year where you don't have discovery grant funding. So I would get involved in bigger grants too. And I would use all of the things I've said, when, even when you're involved in those bigger grants, it doesn't come for free. So you're still asked to, to comment and help with the application itself and read them and really add value based on this sort of thing because so many people are working so hard that sometimes you miss some of the, 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 the sort of easy things to tick off. It's okay. Mentorship is okay. So are there different bins for early career researchers and other researchers? And what are the bins and how are they in <laughs> Oh, these are good questions. Okay, so the way it works. So the question is, uh, you mentioned moderate on a bin. What does that mean? Okay, so do I have two minutes? Yeah, of course. If you have two minutes. Or do you, I have two minutes. So basically... I brought this just to show you. This is the grid that was used in 2017 when I was first a member of this committee. And I was scared. I was in Ottawa. I was like, how do I make sure I'm doing this properly? So you spend the first night calibrating. So we have a whole bunch of mathematicians, applied mathematicians, and statisticians in one room. And we're all very different. Okay? so. Basically, the way it worked was we were all supposed to make sure that for any given proposal, we would, in these three sort of subgroups, we would evaluate people the same. So essentially what happened is you're scored on these three um, criteria. I've said them once already, but they're important. Excellence of researcher, merit of proposal, and training of HQP. So those are the, uh, the, the, the columns, if you will, across the top goes from insufficient to moderate, to strong, to very strong, to outstanding, to exceptional. I don't mean to scare you, but really you need to be strong, strong, strong. Generally, based on how the funding envelope looks in Canada, you need to be over here to get funded. Everything in orange is the tiny language differences. So listen to this. So this is EOR, Excellence of Researcher. To get a moderate, the accomplishments presented in the application were deemed to be of reasonable quality, impact, or importance. That is not going to get you funded. The accomplishments presented in the application were deemed to be solid in their quality, impact, and or importance. That's a strong. That is fundable. So, so, so ex ex exceptional is the highest category. Acknowledged as a leader who has continued to make over the last six years influential accomplishments at the highest level of quality, impact, and or importance to a broad community. So when you first look at, your, at this grid, you're like, how do I do this? Um, but I will tell you, most people are somewhere in the middle. There's very few out here, and fortunately there's very few in the insufficient tale. Insufficient, if you don't have short and long-term objectives, you go right back there. That is where, so there's a lot of research programs that if you don't follow the NSERC guidelines, you can still end up down there. If you have an incomplete CCV, all of these things which I've seen people, and they call it the halo effect in NSERC, so you will see somebody who has done amazing work for years, who decides... I don't have time to complete my CCV, and it's not going to matter, because I'm that good. Well, it matters. 
because you can get an insufficient if we can't see what we need to see to evaluate it properly. So there's all sorts of things that make it so that you can be successful on this grid, but you need to know what's expected of you, which is why I say read the instructions. Because it's, there's no rolling or flipping a coin here. It really means you just have to put in what's asked for. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let's take a Okay. Time.